Hi, I'm Cynthia Brazil. And in my research, my students and I, we design, we develop, and we deploy social robots. We deploy these robots in real human environments, places like schools, homes, hospitals, assisted living facilities, where these robots are designed to engage people, to help us learn, to help us stay healthy, to help us maintain our well-being, from children to seniors. And what I hope you can appreciate from this video is how deeply and richly interpersonal the interactions are that people have with this particular kind of technology. So much so that even after 20 years of developing these systems, I'm still struck by the depth at which this kind of technology can engage our social minds and even touch our hearts. So much so that I also have a vision for AI. And I envision an AI that not only helps us to be smarter and more productive, but I want to see AI also help us to flourish. Right? The ability for people to deeply connect with each other and even technology, I think, makes this a compelling thought proposition and I think with important contributions to society. But to do that, to be able to promote our well-being, AI needs to be able to engage our social and emotional selves in addition to our cognitive selves. Right? So this morning we heard a lot about the significance and importance and how fascinating our social and emotional intelligence is. Matthew Lieberman is a well-respected social neuroscientist, has said that social thinking is our human su superpower. That uh, our ability to feel what other people are feeling, our ability to appreciate the thoughts of others, our ability to work as members of a team is indeed a pinnacle of achievement of our brains. And we've also learned this morning that there are specialized structures that support our social thinking and support our emotional thinking in the limbic system. But there's more, right? It doesn't just stop at the brain, it's not just restricted to the brain, but emotion, for instance, is embodied. Through the limbic system and the autonomic nervous system, we experience emotion through our bodies. And we can measure even activity of emotion in our brains through things like our heart rate, our, uh, our respiration, and even uh, electrodermal activity. They give us windows into the emotional processing of our brains. But of course, there's still more, because our bodies are also situated in a world with social others. And the way we communicate and the way we interact allows us to influence the emotions of each other, how we think, how we behave, our attitudes, right? So we want to think about how can we learn to understand the nature of our social emotional intelligence, and especially in the context of technology, it really motivates new kinds of tools to, that can engage us in all of these levels. And in my lab, we've been exploring the use of social robots as that kind of tool. As social robots, they can stimulate human interpersonal behaviors. We can collect data sets that are much needed in order to do that. We can computationally model these processes. I'll show you some video so of this, right? Um, and we live in a world where we have a lot of certain kinds of <laughs> data, but not a lot of data like this, right? So we learned this morning about the importance of how young children are biased to learn from an attentive, friendly other. Well, if you want to design a robot to be able to do that, you need to kind of understand, say, how children do this. How do children learn from each other in a friendly context? We can track behavior such as facial expressions, the way children speak, the way they take turns. We can computationally model these processes in order to try to understand and explain these behaviors. But then we can embed those models in a social robot who can interact with children in the same kind of situation and see not only how well do those models perform in the world in real interaction, but even what potentially is the impact for the person, right? So one of the great things about robots is they're not only a cool way for us to potentially learn about our social emotional intelligence, they can also be a tool or intervention to help we grow our own intelligence, right? So this is a slide highlighting some work we've been doing on learning how to personalize learning for children, for young children around their oral language skills. So here we've been applying reinforcement learning because again, as it turns out, there's a lot of data sets that don't exist. And there's a lot of situations where robots have to actually learn from their own interaction in the world with people in real time. So in this particular model, we're applying reinforcement learning by which a robot is trying to learn a personalized policy to each child to figure out what complexity of a story should tell a child at a particular moment to maximize their learning. The robot is looking at things such as facial expressions variability to be able to predict uh, how, what kinds of things, what kind of stories are going to engage the child. 
as well as the sophistication of the story in terms of the vocabulary and the syntax structure. And through this process, we can actually develop policies. Here you can see uh, the differences in policies that are being uh, learned for each child that basically will then help promote children's own oral language production as well as the vocabulary. So we can see here in a study we've done over a 12-week period with the Boston Public Schools, schools that have high English language learner populations, that children, when they interact with a personalized social robot, demonstrate new syntactic skills faster than with a non-personalized robot that follows a fixed curriculum, and children interacting with the personalized robot learn more vocabulary, right? So this is really, really compelling. And in fact, when we think about the future, we are starting to live and work with AI uh, in a way that is far more pervasive than it was even five years ago. This question of who interacts with technology and AI is changing. You think about children today, they're not only digital natives, they're AI natives, right? They're growing up at a time where they've always been able to interact with intelligent machines. So the ability of these systems to live with us, to be able to potentially collect data about us, to be able to personalize us, personalize to us, opens up this possibility of a future of scalable, affordable, effective, personalized services and support across many, many different domains, right? So you think about personalized education, personalized healthcare, personalized coaching. And of course, it's important that these systems be personalized because over a very diverse population, people have a lot of different needs, right? From abilities even to disabilities. And even when we may be feeling our most vulnerable, because it's when we're feeling vulnerable that we may need help the most. And this, of course, raises this question of the ethical application of these technologies as well. So, we're living in a time where a lot of people are feeling vulnerable. We hear in the media about the decline in empathy. We know that chronic loneliness and social isolation is on the rise. And for a profoundly social species, the pain associated with loneliness or isolation is real pain. The stress it causes on the body is real stress that can result in increased health risks that are commensurate with obesity, substance abuse, and smoking. So we have this opportunity where can AI be designed to really support ourselves in a social, emotional capacity to promote and accelerate our well-being? And how can it be planned in ways that we may not anticipate? These explorations are happening today. I'm going to show you a quick video to highlight this of the application of a robot. Aaron Partridge, a aging. researcher and art therapist with Elder Care Alliance, takes Jibo with her when she meets with the seniors. She says this is not a case of caretakers being replaced by automation. Instead, they're using this cute piece of technology to encourage their residents to connect with each other. Jibo inspired some giggles and guffaws amongst this group here. When you get this age, you should be able to laugh more and more. What it does, it, it brings that out of us. Uh, that's part of the miracle of it. Uh, and that's part of the miracle of living as far as that goes. So I see tremendous reason for optimism in our relationship with these socially emotional technologies are really going to be able to benefit us. I want to now look at another really critical area that's facing society. So mood disorders, right? According to the World Health Organization, right now, depression is the leading cause of ill health and disability worldwide. If we look at this chart, we see two populations and how they handle negative events in their environment. We have a resilient population that's able to bounce back, but then we have another population that's unable to do that. They're the ones who are susceptible to mood disorders like depression. The challenge, of course, is typically in our healthcare system, we intervene out here when these symptoms have already set in. We intervene through periodic assessments done on standardized scales, like the Hamilton Depression uh, uh, Rating Scale. And the question then, and the opportunity of technology, is can you actually use technology to sense when these things diverge much sooner, intervene sooner, so you might be able to even prevent depression in the first place? And this is a problem that's being tackled by my colleague, Rosalind Picard, at the Media Lab. So she has applied uh, regression-based machine learning methods to say, okay, so here we can work with clinicians, we can have these uh, HDRS scores, uh, we can also, from the same population of people, collect data through mobile devices, through wearables, things like track uh, skin conductance and heart rate, to be able to characterize things like sleep, your communication patterns, your physical activity, your locations, and apply these machine learning methods to say, can we now predict these scores 
based on the continuous real-time data collected in daily life. And this chart basically shows that she's been able to successfully do that, which of course is tremendously exciting. She's also gone ahead to think about, so what about predicting your mood or your wellness forecast? Can we take similar kinds of data from mobile devices and wearables to be able to say, based on what the data says today, what you're going to be feeling or emotional being tomorrow? She, with her students, have, has applied multitask learning, which is a form of transfer learning, to be able to show that not only are, are you able to do this, but she shows the importance of personalization, because people have different behaviors that affect their well-being differently. So for instance, this person up here, when they text the night before, it actually elevates the mood the next day, but this other person has the exact opposite effect. And she can infer these differences from her models, which means that the system should actually give different kinds of advice. So this is very intriguing. So we can Think about tackling all kinds of problems with AI, right? The question is really what problems do we decide to solve? Which gives rise to an even bigger question for me, which is who creates with AI, right? In a society, there's only a few of us who have the skills and ability and the know-how to apply AI to solutions, then we risk a society where those benefits only address the needs of those groups, of the few, rather than of everyone, right? So, how do we address this? Well, clearly AI education is the key, and beyond AI education, the ability to create tool sets that really empower anyone and everyone, from kids to seniors, say, to be able to create solutions that matter to them with AI. And my students and I have been doing this uh, in the Media Lab, building on the Scratch programming language developed by Mitch Reslick, also in the Media Lab, and I want to show you a quick video of this vision. So again, when we mean empowering so everyone, today we're we mean everyone. About <laughs> controlling robots. Yes. As you can see, we're using a tablet. Yes. Which is what scientists sometimes use. So developing activities, toolkits that no, allow kids to, to be able to explore concepts in AI, things like generative AI, rule-based systems, classification. So that was not the same as mine. By interacting with these robots and playing around with those algorithms. The ability to use these intuitive blocks to be able to program a robot to learn from demonstration in a really intuitive way. And then also importantly to think about, you know, how can we think about tools that allow people to design and orchestrate their own AI enabled experiences in the context of their homes. So we've been looking at adding extensions to, to Scratch about Internet of Things services, about AI services mm -hmm. that allow hey, people now to create sophisticated programs. Hi, I had a very long day. Oh no, it you sounds like, like you sentiment should relax. Analysis, Let me set the mood person for you. ID, relax and play chill music. To be able to have these AIs collaborate. <laughs> your favorite coffee house from Spotify. To change your environment, your hue lights for instance. And just think about how empowering that is, right? So again, we really think about anyone and everyone, from kids to seniors being able to really customize the world through these kinds of programming languages. So I'm going to conclude now. So again, my vision of AI is not just a one about brilliant machines, but humanistic machines. And for us to be able to get there is going to require a deep collaboration, not only between science and engineering, but design and ethics, real-world application, and many others. And this is the reason why I think the bridge is so important and why I am very excited to be a part of it. Thank you.